morning. morning. We're going to run the trailer for our October 14th movie night now. And I have a couple of points to make afterwards. Intelligence. Stamina. Courage. And heart. Business is dogs. He's undersized. He's trouble. Well, good afternoon. He's untrainable. Stop that! Ah! What does he bring to the breed? The heart of a survivor. He outran every single one of them. He's not a sled dog. He's a lead dog. What we have in our children is an epidemic. The death sentence. They found a cure. Round trip is 600 miles. You see that storm on the horizon? Only one man and one dog can make that run. He's 12 years old. He's too old. He'll never make that distance. Got one more in your pup. My guess is we don't find him till the thaw. All right, Togo. Time for us to find out who we are. I always thought he lived for the sled. When all along, what he lived for was me. I got the Togo! So what we will be having on the 14th is in fact a true story. A few little snippets, there were several sled dog teams who participated in what became a relay of the 1925 diphtheria serum relay. Most teams ran an average of 30 miles. Togo's team ran over 200 miles. At 12 years old, which is every bit a senior citizen for a Husky. And Balto, you may have seen a children's cartoon movie called Balto. Balto ran the last 30 miles and therefore was there when the, the press were there. Some of this may become a little relevant later on. The statue in Central Park of New York City commemorating the relay is of Balto. It took until 2011 for Time Magazine to award Togo the title of the most courageous animal ever. And in fact, the dog who portrays Togo through most of the movie is a dog named Diesel. He is from the east coast of Canada, and he is in fact a descendant of Togo, one of what's known now as Sepala Huskies. Worth noting one little line in that uh, trailer, Togo was undersized. Remember that later. Hello, everybody. Um, just wanted to let everybody know, just touch base this morning a little bit. Um, we are looking at uh, another Inspiring Hearts, the end of November. Uh, I believe it's 25th is the date, um, which is a good thing. We always love those events. They're going really well. Um, however, because they are going so well, Roxanne and I need some help. So what we're trying to do is form a planning committee, planning group. Uh, she is gonna get two members from the Baha'i community. I'm looking to get two people from our community. So there's three from each side. Um, and together we will work at um, planning Inspiring Hearts, but other events like that. So if anybody is interested, um, by all means, come and talk to me. I can fill you in on more details. Um, so we're, like I said, I'm looking for two people. Um, 
if I don't get any volunteers, I'll be kind of volunteering people. Um, so it's, you know, hopefully we can get some volunteers. Um, the other, that, that's it, thing number one. Number two uh, is regarding the community food share program. I am looking for somebody who is willing to kind of step up and, uh, and help me with that program with the end goal of taking over that program. Um, it's building some capacity for, for us to be able to do stuff here out of Woodfield. Um, because if I can get somebody to take over that program and continue it on, then that frees me up to be able to start some of these other programs that, that we have uh, in the works. So um, I'm putting it a call for that too. So if there's somebody who's interested and willing uh, to do that, uh, by all means, come and talk to me after and I can kind of fill you in on the details and kind of what's required and expected of that. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to welcome those who are here in person and those who uh, will join virtually for this service this morning. Uh, uh, a couple more announcements of just uh, congregational life things that are happening. Uh, next Sunday, of course, is, is Thanksgiving. So I've already made a couple of mistakes this morning because I had my mind focused on next week's service, which I was preparing because I was presiding, and then Derek informed me he's speaking in Windsor today, so he switched me. So I'm now working off of this, this uh, order of worship, and I keep mixing up next week's in my head. So excuse me if I make a few uh, little mistakes, but next Sunday, uh, Derek will be presiding, and our teacher, Scott Shearer, will be speaking for our Canadian Thanksgiving worship service. And then uh, October the 15th is the Children's Sabbath, and uh, priest Bill Ashwell will be our guest speaker. Of course, the week after that, the 21st, 22nd, will be special services. It's the Canada East Mission Fall Conference. There'll be an ordination service here at 10 a.m., followed by a make your own sandwich lunch from 11 to 12. The fixings will all be supplied in here uh, in the fellowship hall so that at 12 o'clock, we will participate in the 12 o'clock service, which will be broadcast beyond the walls, but will be broadcast from here. Art Smith will be the, Apostle Art Smith will be our speaker uh, who will be speaking at the beyond the walls here in London. October 28th, keep in mind that we do have that Saturday, we do have the celebration of life for David Kilgore uh, here at uh, Woodfield. Uh, I'm arranging that with uh, Leslie, who was a mus musician here, uh, and uh, asked if we could have the celebration of life here for David, uh, because David really appreciated coming here when Leslie played. And so 
We will be uh, keeping that in mind. All are invited for the 11 a.m. celebration of life on Saturday, October 28th. That brings me to the invitation to worship. Today, as we worship and share together at the table of the Lord's Supper, you are invited to reflect on the faith stories of others, remember through stories of God at work, repent through prayer seeking Christ's peace, find renewal through the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, rejoice in the word, recommit, be blessed, and be sent forth. And that brings us to our call to worship, which is taken from Psalm 78, 1 to 4. Pay attention, my people, to my instruction. Listen to the words I speak. I will sing a song that imparts wisdom. I will make insightful observations about the past, what we have heard and learned, that which our ancestors have told us. We will not hide from their descendants. We will tell the next generation about the Lord's praiseworthy acts, about his strength and the amazing things he has done. We will now rise and sing, now in this moment. Good morning, Lord. It is good to come together, to join as community, as we share in the communion, and we share in the spoken words, and we share in the music. We know, Lord, that your spirit is always with us if we but look to you. We thank you, Lord, for all those we come in contact with and for the opportunities we have to share your love. Be with us now, Lord. Be with those gathered here, those who gather virtually, and also, Lord, be with those who could not be here, that they too will feel your spirit and our love. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. I'm now going to share a moment of story. Uh, 
And in preparing my thoughts this week, I thought it might be worthwhile for me to share my communion experience and what communion has meant to me in my life. My first communion took place in the Anglican Church after I had been confirmed as a member at 12 years old uh, in the Anglican Church. And as part of that confirmation, you, you are confirmed and then you share in your first communion as part of that confirmation. I still remember it, primarily because of the gentleman who led our confirmation class. He was an individual who had a very strong faith as a, a minister of the church, in, of the Anglican church. Uh, and that communion was very important to me. And then I joined the community of Christ. And communion in the community of Christ has been a journey for me. Because when I joined Community of Christ, it was at the time when com Community of Christ were closed communionists, which basically meant you had to be baptized and confirmed in the church, the Community of Christ, in order to be served communion. And that always kind of made me feel a little like it was an exclusive club. And then, of course, the discussion moved from close to close communion. And close communion meant, well, you could serve people who weren't members if they really wanted to take it. And then we became open communion. And one of the things I always remember from my communion experience I was pastoring a congregation in Delhi, and we had a lady who was attending, but she never attended on communion Sundays. She was not a member of our church. And I remember going over and visiting with her one evening at her place, and we got talking about different things, and, she, and the subject of the communion came up. And she made a statement to me that always has stuck with me in regards to closed communion. And she said, you know, I don't come on communion Sundays because it's like being invited to somebody's house at dinner time and then being told to sit there and watch while they eat. And so that to her meant she just would not attend. When I think of the significance of community uh, of Christ in regards to communion now, I am so pleased that we are inclusive and open and sharing and welcoming.
our prayer for peace. O oh God, who is continuously at work in creation, we unite our hearts in prayer as we pause and focus on the need for justice and peace in our lives and the world. The news is filled with stories that do not reflect your vision of shalom. We confess that we sometimes become overwhelmed by these stories. We also confess that we sometimes get in the way of your work in the world, both directly and indirectly. We call upon your grace and forgiveness as we prepare to participate in the sacrament of communion. God of all generations, give us courage to be your ambassadors of peace, doing your work in our families, neighborhoods, cities, and world. Guide us with divine wisdom in determining where and how we can make a positive difference in the places where we live and serve. Let our words proclaim your Son and promote communities of joy, hope, love, and peace. Let our actions reflect our best understanding of who you are as we work for justice and share Christ's peace. Grant us courage and hope when we are fearful or discouraged. In the name of Jesus, the peaceful one, we pray. Amen. Our communion scripture this morning comes from 1 Corinthians. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Pardon me, I should really read the bulletin that I'm holding in my hands. Apparently it's my turn. I'll open this morning with the words of a Jewish rabbi named Yohim Prince. Neighbor is not a geographic term. It is a moral concept. I stand before you with no doubt that the Jew for whom our community is named would agree. After all, he came not that we may just have life, but that we may have it more abundantly. One of the greatest lines that has come from a president prophet, at least in my lifetime, is the mission of Jesus Christ is what matters most for the journey ahead. But what is that mission? What is the message? We are given some advice in this week's lectionary scripture found in the second letter to the Philippians that is attributed to Paul. If then there is any comfort in Christ, any consolation from love, any partnership in spirit, any tender affection and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord with one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Now, those of you who know me for some time know I have struggled and do continue to struggle with humility. I made some progress when I learned that I was looking at it incorrectly. My friends, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. The scripture goes on. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave 
Assuming human likeness and being found in appearances as human, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. I spent a lot of time on that concept in the most recent Lenten season this spring. In order for Jesus to die for us, he had to die as one of us, scared, in pain, and alone. How else would he have appealed to his heavenly father for another way? Scripture continues, Therefore God exalted him even more highly and gave him the name that is above every other name. So the name given to Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and earth and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work on your own salvation in fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will to work for his good pleasure. Now, I want to repeat one of those lines. Not only in my presence, but much more in my absence. You see, friends, integrity is doing the right thing when no one's looking. But what is that work we are supposed to be doing? According to what is called the Great Commission, it is, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. But what did Jesus say? When asked by his disciples what the greatest of commandments is, he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. It is the greatest and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On those two commandments hang the law and the prophets. So are the commission and the commandment in conflict? Let's break them down. To follow them both, you have to greet your neighbor with, I love you as I love myself. Except this one little thing about you that I really think should change. Nothing big, just a piece of your core identity. So is the Great Commission wrong? Not really. But many of the ways we, and we meaning the greater Christian church, have gone about it may need a little tweaking. And Community of Christ continues to make efforts in that direction. I think Ron's testimony about the, the change of our communion practices is particularly apt as an example. One of our mission initiatives is invite people to Christ. Anything I know about invitation began in Mapleton, Ontario, somewhere just prior to 1980. Now, my parents were always pretty good at not letting my sister and I know when there wasn't much money. To this end, we once had a family camping trip all the way to my grandparents' front yard. This was located in the aforementioned Mapleton. Some of you may have driven past it. Whoever there now has agility dogs. You see, they got ramps and teeter-totters and all kinds of things for dogs. That is the property that was the genesis of my family. Now, this is not as sad as it may seem. There was a swimming pool, a large wooded property, and the coolest playhouse ever, which was underneath the bridge where what was then called Highway 74 crossed the creek. Very early in this experience, I learned about welcome. I learned about inclusion. We were in bed one night, very late by my parents' standards, meaning it was dark, and we suddenly heard the sound the unmistakable sound of the human body hitting water. Someone was swimming in the middle of the night. Now that sounds very tame now, but to seven-year-old me, that was the height of excitement. What turned out to be happening is that my Aunt Margaret had returned home from her afternoon shift and was having a dip before bed. So this is me one-ish. My sister and I asked our parents if we might swim as well, and I'm still a little excited, oddly enough, when I remember being told, yes, swimming after midnight. 
the excitement of it all. Okay, so I led a pretty sheltered existence back then. But this version of a vacation was no doubt born of a need to limit expenses, but my mother was still really proud. So we took our own food, and we weren't to be bothering my grandmother for things. Are there any grandmothers in the congregation today? Are the grandchildren coming looking for cookies a bother? A lot of grandmothers might respond. Oddly enough, my son's grandmother would definitely say this, I'll feed my grandson if I want. My grandmother was a little more clever than that. She would put the cookies in the oven and open the kitchen window and just sort of let nature happen. Both of these stories speak to one word, welcome. When do we feel loved? When we are welcome. I learned about love out there in Mapleton too, and it starts with a newborn English Springer Spaniel puppy named Stanley. Stanley got off to a rough start. Very early in his life, Stanley had inhaled some of the shavings used as bedding, and his lungs became infected. And when I, I say early in his life, hours, maybe days. A choice had to be made. If Stanley lived, and that was a maybe, he would no doubt be undersized and have health problems. He would now need to be rehomed as a pet, not as a show or hunting dog. The expenses and hours involved in his survival would never be recouped. That survival would depend on spending days and nights being monitored next to a steamer. That was the choice, steamer or euthanasia. I may have been given up the answer when I told you the puppy's name was Stanley. Yes, he was named for the steamer. It may be difficult for some of you who knew RLDS elders back in the 60s to imagine one sitting up all night next to a steamer nursing back to health a working dog who would never earn his keep. Stanley was sold as a pet, but he did return to visit. To everyone's utter surprise, Stanley was indeed the wrong size for a show dog. He was too big. Stanley had indeed thrived because he was loved. One more little note tying the story back to humility. Yes, it was my grandfather who nursed Stanley back to health. And I've heard this story in my family for decades now. But who is the one individual who never mentioned it? But I digress. Some of the discussions that we have had and continue to have is what do we do when we encounter those who look, live, love, pray, worship, and vote differently than we do? Sometimes it is suggested that we be tolerant. How many of you enjoy being tolerated? It doesn't give one warm, fuzzy feelings, does it? Wouldn't you be rather be welcomed, embraced, and loved? It isn't enough to want that for ourselves. We need to want it for everyone, as we are told to love our neighbor as ourselves. In Luke 15, Jesus was once asked who we must accept as our neighbor. And he told this story. A man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and took off, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite. And when he came to the place and saw him, pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came upon him and bandaged his wounds, treating them with oil and wine. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave him to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back I will repay you whatever more you will spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said, Go and do likewise. 
Now, this parable is often robbed of its power by being misunderstood. Let's break it down. A man's beaten, robbed, left for dead. Two important figures in Hebrew society of the day passed by. When Jesus spoke, he used priest and Levite. Yes, religious figures. But in this time, faith was at the heart of Hebrew society. A mentor of mine, when preaching this parable, made the two individuals a community of Christ, high priest, and 70. He was criticized afterwards by a member of that congregation because it made the parable too pointed. That person had missed the point, as we so often do. It's supposed to be pointed. This parable is designed to have the listener staring at their shoes. What is important is that they were held in high regard by the people that Jesus was speaking to as he gave this lesson. Given today, it could still be a religious figure, but to a lot of society, a beloved politician, celebrity, whoever. In your mind, make it a position of respect, and in this parable, that respect was not earned. Who does stop is a Samaritan. Now this would have shocked Jesus' audience. To them, a good Samaritan was pretty much an oxymoron. Not only would Jesus' audience have been aghast that this was who stopped, but they would balk at the mere idea that an innkeeper gave one credit. As I said earlier, we have robbed this parable of some of its power by failing to understand the details. We have made a good Samaritan anyone who stops and helps. But the key is outcast. The key is not welcome in Jewish society. So let's update that one too. Had Jesus given this parable in the United States in the late 50s and 1960s, who would the Samaritan have been? Probably a black man. In a lot of North America in the aftermath of September 11, 2001, who would it have been? More than likely a Muslim. And who would it be today? May I suggest to many it would be effective as a trans person or drag performer. The point is, we all have our Samaritan, the category we see as other. We don't necessarily hate them, but we don't see them as part of our circle. And when we do see them, we think of higher fences, not longer tables. And that is who we are commanded to love. That is the work. It is said that free speech rights exist to protect unpopular speech. Why? Popular speech doesn't need protecting. In similar fashion, the great commandment is there to instruct us to love the ones that it is harder to love. Why? Well, the extremely easy to love require no commandment. And here's the thing. We are all the Samaritan in someone's story. A long time ago, there was a miserable little town. It was dark, gloomy, uneducated, and uninteresting. The residents walk around with a dark heart and a closed mind. Then one day, a king came to visit. He told the residents of this miserable little town that he had secretly replaced one of the local babies with his own child. The people were terrified. What if the king came back and his child was unhappy? Not knowing who the royal child was, the people wisely assumed that it could be anyone among their local children. So they began making a campaign of making sure that child, whoever it was, was happy. To this end, they built schools, free hospitals, libraries, and playgrounds. They did the work. They adopted a more positive outlook, wanting to encourage that in the mystery child. Remember, they didn't know who he or she was. Many years went by, and the children grew into adults and had children of their own. These children were indeed happy because they had been nurtured, they had been educated, they had been loved. One day, the king did return. 
During his visit, one little old lady dared approach him and asked, It's my girl, isn't it? My beautiful, born, grown daughter. She is the one. And the king looked at the woman and said, They are all the one. I don't know who to credit with this story, but it puts me in mind of someone I admire deeply. I think the name is, of course, television host Fred Rogers. I think most of us know Fred's work. Some of us may not know his first name was Fred. To generations of children, he was Mr. Rogers. Rogers was a Presbyterian minister, a deeply religious man. And yet he never talked about religion on his show. Or did he? He talked about feelings. He talked about emotions. He talked about things like racial equality at a time when very few mentioned these things, particularly to children. He talked about love. I recently read an interview where Fred discussed what it is to love. He said, love isn't a state of perfect caring. It's an active noun, like struggle. To love someone is to strive to accept that person exactly the way he or she is right here and now. And this is the important part. He goes on. I believe appreciation is a holy thing, that when we look at what is best in a person we happen to be with at the moment, we are doing what God does all the time. So in loving and appreciating our neighbor, we are participating in something sacred. That is life, but more abundant. Let's work on that. Have a good week. Before I do the official um, invitation to communion, I thought I'd tell you a little story. And I sit here and think of it while Ron told his reflections on closed communion. I am so glad that I came along in the era of open communion in terms of having to serve it 
All the inclusiveness, it's all true, but for me, my problem when I do not have the memory to go through a full congregation and remember who I should put the plate in front of and who I shouldn't. As I was preparing for ordination uh, to a priest, I read stories of people who were ordained priests during that era of closed communion. And one of them had asked his mentor in all seriousness, what do I do if someone who's not baptized and confirmed to this church reaches for communion? And it wasn't a joke. The serious answer he got was, step on their foot. I'm so glad that we've moved on past that. As all are welcome at Christ's table. The Lord's Supper, or communion, is a sacrament which we remember the life, death, resurrection, and continuing presence of Jesus Christ. In community of Christ, we also experience communion as an opportunity to renew our baptismal covenant and to be formed as disciples who live Christ's mission. Others may have different or added understandings within their faith traditions. We invite all who participate in the Lord's Supper to do so in the love and peace of Jesus Christ. I'll now ask you to kneel as far as possible facing the emblems while priest Wayne Stronghill reads the combined prayer on the bread and wine. Eternal God, we ask you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this bread and wine to the souls of all those who receive them, that they may eat and drink in remembrance of the body and the blood of your son and witness to you. O oh God, that they are willing to take upon them the name of your Son and always remember him and keep the commandments which he has given them, and that they may always have his Spirit to be with them. Amen. Thank you. 
We're going to take a couple of minutes now and share in what is a form of a spiritual practice. As we have heard the message that Steve has brought us this morning and as we've shared in communion, too often we treat them as separate. So what I would like us to do is I'm going to read the scripture that was the basis that Steve shared his message on. And then I'm going to ask that you spend a minute in your own mind thinking about the communion and the message and how they are connected as we share in community. If there is in any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others, others as better than yourself. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me not only in my presence but much more now in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So take a moment, consider the words that Steve shared and the communion that you shared in. The disciples' generous response. During this time of a disciples' generous response, we focus on aligning our hearts with God's heart. Our financial ties marked for local mission, tie, mission ties help our congregation meet the local budget and all that it supports. Our financial ties designated for worldwide mission ties support the ministries and services of our global church. Through our ties, we tangibly express our gratitude to God who is the giver of all. We make a positive influence in the world, both locally and globally, through our combined ties of time, talent, treasure, and testimony. Today, we share in the abundance available at the table of communion. Now we turn our hearts and mind to, to we reflect on our mission initiative to abolish poverty and end suffering. Remember that there are others in the world who have needs that we have the capacity to meet. We recommit ourselves anew to being Jesus' hands, feet, voice, and advocacy in the world. May all that we have to tithe, our time, talent, treasure, and testimony be consecrated for doing God's work in the world. As is the community of Christ's practice when we share in communion any undesignated contributions in the offering plate, will be designated to worldwide mission ties, abolish poverty and suffering, which includes oblation ministry. As you make your offering, please rejoice in the gifts you have received and recommit yourself as a whole life steward, 
responding to support God's work locally and around the world, we commit these offerings to the work of God. Let's join in our closing hymn, Church of Christ Now Poised Anew. ask you to bless this service and to bless all those who have gathered to participate in this service. And we also stop, Lord, to ask that you bless those who are in need, those who are suffering, those who feel lost, those who need your guiding love. And we also pray, Lord, that you will bless us, that we too may become your hands, your feet, your tongue, and your blessings to others throughout our daily life. Be with us as we leave now, Lord. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Sending forth, remember, it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Go and join wherever you find God at work.